Okay, great. We will make a start then. So I would just like to say hello and welcome to today's open event where we'll be providing you with an overview of our exciting burns, plastic and reconstructive surgery postgraduate programme. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Kate Thomas. I am the events officer for the Faculty of Medical Sciences here at UCL and your chair this afternoon. We're hoping in this session we'll address those core specific questions you may have and we'll help you to gain an insight into what it is really like to study burns, plastic and reconstructive surgery at UCL. So this afternoon we have Deepak who will provide you with a summary of our exciting postgraduate programme and there'll be a Q&A session so there'll be plenty of interactive opportunities for you all to join in throughout today's event. This session is being recorded and will be made available following today's event on our website. We're here to respond to your questions, so please do put those in the Q&A function on Zoom throughout today's event. Now to introduce our speaker, we have Deepak Kalaska. Dr Kalaska is Associate Professor of Bioengineering at UCL. His research focuses on design and development of novel medical devices, implants and regenerative therapies using 3D technologies. And that includes 3D imaging, scanning and printing for, uh, for various musculoskeletal conditions. He is co-chair and director of the postgraduate MSc course in burns, plastic and reconstructive surgery at UCL. He is also actively involved in clinically translational research. So thank you so much all. Before I hand over to Deepak, we do just have a few poll questions that we'd like to, to put out to you. So you should hopefully see those on your screen now. Um, so we're just asking you currently, we're keen to know uh, where you're currently based. Um, what is your current level of qualification? Are you interested in studying on a full-time or part-time basis? And which of the following are you interested in studying? So um, this will just really help Deepak in the next part of the, the event so he can gain a better insight into what you're interested in hearing about as well. So we'll just give you a few more moments there. I can see that we're getting a lot of responses in already, so that's great. Okay, and I will end the poll there. So I can see that we have about 25% of you that are based in the UK and 75% are overseas. Uh, what is your current level of qualification? So we've got 38% are currently studying towards medical degree, 63% are other. So um, that's really great to know. If, if you'd like to let us know um, what the other is as well, please do feel free to um, tell us in the Q&A function. Uh, are you interested in studying on a full-time or part-time basis? So 63% are full-time, 25% are interested in part-time, and 13% are other. And which of the following are you interested in studying? So 88% interested in the MSc, and 13% are interested in the PG certificate. So that's fantastic. Great. Well, I hope that sets the scene well, Deepak, to hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, let me share my screen. So, um, right. Oh, uh, now, I think the Kate already explained you how this is going to work. I'm just going to go through my presentation, give you a brief overview of the course itself, tell you the way the course is going to work, what the deadlines are, when the course is going to start. I will give you a bit overview uh, about how the structure of the course is being laid out, what are the content of the course. We won't go into detail, we don't have a time, but you can always ask those questions. Uh, and I don't want to make it overwhelming uh, while we are going through, um, I got about 46 slides, okay? So it's a lot, but I will try and rush, uh, I don't want to rush through it, but give you enough information to make uh, you aware about what the potential for this MSc course is, who are we looking for, what kind of students can benefit from it, uh, from there, right? So let me make a start. 
Uh, so as a, as a key member of the staff, there are two people here. Um, one is uh, Professor uh, Peter Butler, who is a professor of plastic and reconstructive surgery, and myself. Uh, I'm a professor of bioengineering. We both are based at UCL in Division of Surgery and International Sciences. Uh, now, just to, just to first go back about uh, where the UCL is, and I can see there, there is a quite few of you from uh, other institutions and outside UK. So we are actually at heart of London, not very far from the famous tourist attraction of Big Ben or uh, Buckingham Palace. You can literally walk um, 50, 30 to 40 minutes, <clears throat> uh, pleasant walk there. So when you come to London, uh, this is something I'm sure you will enjoy. Uh, now coming back to the UCL itself, so UCL is a very old university. Uh, technically, it's uh, quite new if you compare that with Oxford and Cambridge, uh, but it's a modern university established in 1826. Uh, we have over 40,000 students, more than 12,000 academic staff, uh, which gives you a scale of how big the university is. It's ranked within top 10, um, along with Oxford and Cambridge and Imperial. The medical school in uh, uh, the UCL medical school is number one in terms of its research income, in terms of its translation uh, and the impact which actually produces. So which is what going to be the main uh, drive for you to come to UCL. I have put four major hospitals. We call them UCL hospitals. And the UCL is one of the universities who got a lot more hospitals under its umbrella than any other universities in UK. And that is the reason why we actually specialize in medical education. So Royal Free Hospital is where the specific course, burns and plastic surgery is actually based because this is a specialty center for plastic and reconstructive surgery in London. Uh, we have a uh, other associate hospital, it's called Royal National Orthopedic Hospital. Then UCLH uh, is the UCLH U uh, UCL Hospital and Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. So uh, we collaborate, we work uh, with most of these hospitals and uh, the staff who are going to come and teach on this course are actually going to be coming from these uh, hospitals um, in London. But at the same time, we will get some staff which are coming outside London, even as far as uh, outside country too, right? But I will come to that eventually. Uh, because we work and we have a such ecosystem where we have so many hospitals within the university uh, attached we have a fantastic engagement with clinicians, patients, industry, and biomedical engineering and scientists, sociologists, and a lot of things, which provides an ample of opportunity for us to design and innovate new things, new therapies, which are directly beneficial for patients. Uh, we not only do the undergraduate, postgraduate, but we also got research programs, which essentially uh, this MSc program can be seen by some student as a uh, building block before they can move on to research degrees. Uh, just to give you about myself, I do a lot of research. Kate mentioned about uh, the type of work I'm doing, but uh, as I mentioned about the hospitals, we have lots of different works and I'm involved in a lot of different things uh, with patient uh, specific implications where I'm working with the National Orthopedic Hospitals on different types of devices, could be custom devices uh, predominantly because the technology which I focus on, or at least my research interests are, is 3D printing, bioprinting, uh, imaging, medical imaging. Uh, with the uh, Royal Free Hospital, we work on facial implants, breast implants, uh, anything you can think of. There is a lot of bone reconstruction work which goes in. We have an ongoing collaboration with Dental Institute. Eastman Dental School is one of the premier institute, which is actually within Royal Free Hospital. So you will actually get an interaction with these colleagues too. Um, we also do a work, which is what I've seen here, which is more futuristic work or a blue sky research looking into tissue engineering, where we'll be looking at engineering organs, tissues, which we currently cannot manufacture, or there is a lack of that uh, as far as the uh, delivery to the patient is concerned. So these are different areas. Everything what you see in the red is the place where we are actually working. We have a research and development work going on. We have a clinical trials running. We have devices which are currently being used by patients, including uh, looking at surgical planning, uh, implants, devices, tissues, and disease modeling, except the drug making, which is pharmacy department who specialize them. Um, 
I'm also editor of four books. Um, there is a new edition of 3D printing in medicine just released this year. But apart from that, one of the highlight of work which we have done is the textbook of plastic surgery. And uh, this is released by UCL Press. Uh, this is an open source book and is freely available. Um, and then uh, there is a contribution to a lot more uh, books I have done over a period. Now, coming back to the course itself. So that was about me. Uh, this is where I actually ask a question, where are you from? But I think uh, it's quite difficult to ask everyone where are you from, but I can see predominantly we have few, few of you from UK and the majority of them from abroad uh, who have joined at a very odd time, uh, maybe it's a different time zone um, that, that you are actually uh, interacting with. But I want to give you a big picture about, we are a very international university. Uh, we get people and the students from pretty much every part of the world. Uh, and you can see the current dots, which are red, and there are some green where the inquiries are actually coming. The students are also coming. Some of these green dots are now become a red dot very recently. So that tells you about the geographically, uh, how diverse community actually comes to UCL. Um, the most common reasons we uh, get from the students to come on this program is career progression, professional development, learn more about plastic surgery, learn how to do research, publications, career change, higher education, such as you are going and using this as a step for a PhD, uh, become more competitive, earn points in NHS because it's a point-based system where you're uh, actually growing from one stage to another. International exposure is another big part of uh, the reason the student actually do. If you have a reason other than that, please do pop that in uh, the chat function. Uh, so later on, we can come and uh, understand what is that motivation you have, now, which is very uh, specific. <clears throat> now, coming back to the course itself, this course is uh, has a very focus aim. So it's uh, designed to actually impart the core knowledge and understanding of burns in plastic surgery. Uh, we are research program. It's a research based uh, base MSc, which is what very uh, which differentiate us from any other MSCs. We have been running this from 2012, so this is more than 10 years now, with uh, nearly 400 MSc students graduated all over the world. Uh, what they have uh, got out of it is they have got the healthcare professional. There were scientists. There were nurses. Uh, and they were all being looking at uh, equipping themselves with uh, research techniques and translational tools which are necessary uh, in this field. After you complete this program, the expectations or the sort of things we hope the students will acquire is the knowledge about the field itself, both scientific as well as the clinical, and they will develop necessary skills, whether they are laboratory skills, synthetic skills, surgical skills, which are required for you to serve your patients better. So to come to the deadline, the final deadline for making an application for this program is 30th of June, um, 5 p.m. And the program will start on 3rd of October, 2023, um, which uh, 3rd of October is Monday. And that is the day we are going to have our induction. And we expect all the students to be in UK by that time to attain this induction program is very important. That's the first day of your program. And from there, everything begins. You have options there. So there are different modes and duration. Based on the duration and the mode you choose, you can have an option for a one-year full-time course. Uh, the part-time course is two-year and the flexible course is up to five years. Uh, there are some limitations about who can do um, a part-time or a five-year uh, uh, course, uh, but you can read about those exact limitation because very specific to the students, whether they need a visa or they don't need a visa. That's something you can read on our website. Um, I'm not a visa expert, so I won't be able to uh, give any advice uh, during this conversation on visas, but there is a full guidance from UCL, which you can actually get it. I put the link here, which is, our prospectus. Um, and I think I will encourage, highly encourage you to go on this prospectus because it tells you if you are a full-time one-year student, what sort of commitment is expected, what you'll be doing, how many hours you require per week. If you want to do this as a part-time, how many hours you require, what modules 
we expect you to do in a year one, what modules we expect you to do in year two, and there is a clear guidance on it. Similarly, flexibility. So five year flexible. This is option we generally see for students who are going and who are in a full time um, uh, employment, and where it's difficult for them to uh, engage with all the modules. They have a lot of travel, or they are based in different country. Uh, we had students coming from all over the world. They have been working in Switzerland, in Netherlands, in uh, Ireland. So a lot of other things in European countries, European country predominantly, not outside Europe, because travel itself can be uh, daunting and expensive. Uh, but students have completed by doing this. It's not easy, but the student who really wanted it to have this qualification, they have done it. Uh, so I'm just giving you those examples, how uh, this is actually being managed and delivered by students. Now let's get back to the MSc program itself. Uh, so uh, all the MSc program in UCL are 180 credits. For these specific programs, there are three core models. The core models are compulsory models, which accounts for 45 credits. Each module is 15 credits. So you have a three compulsory models and you have an option for three optional models out of eight. So there is a list of eight models. You can choose only three, which gives you further 45 credits. And then you have a research project, which is 90 credits. So if you in all summarize this, uh, 90 credits for taught and 90 credits for research. So it's 50-50 division between the research and the taught models. You also have an option if you don't want to uh, enroll for an MSc, you can enroll for PG certificate, which require you complete 60 credits. Okay. And there are some conditions too. So that's something I have mentioned there. Uh, so this is a course structure in uh, a short, the MSc option one, which is 60 to 90 credits, taught module, 90 credit research project, and PG certificate is only modules. So that's 60 credits. Now, what is the requirement for this or eligibility? The eligibility is that you need to have a medical degree, uh, an MBBS, or a minimum second class UK bachelor's degree in related uh, subject. Now, related subject uh, clearly means that I mean, it cannot be a completely different than, uh, so if you're an engineering student, I think there will be some restriction on coming on this course. Uh, but if you have a background within the biology, you had uh, anatomical uh, uh, knowledge, your previous degree actually had a huge emphasis on anatomical understanding, uh, we will consider it. Um, again, it has to be a bachelor degree. Uh, we had applications from nursing, uh, but again, they had a bachelor's degree equivalency, but that equivalency is something the registry can confirm whether they are happy with the equivalency. So I would always encourage you to put that question back to the registry and ask them that are they happy with this qualification? Most of the times, uh, if your indication is that, or the previous experience essentially is looking into specialization of plastic surgery, uh, we, we look that very positively. So we'll look at it that you are interested. And this is where I will come back to the last point, which is your personal statement. When you apply, uh, you are putting uh, details, not only just about your qualification, which is your degree, but the other part, if you are a non-English speaker, you're coming from outside uh, UK, you'll be requiring English language. And for this particular course, our standard is good or advanced. Uh, we cannot compromise on English language qualifications because this is a very um, intense course where you will be required to give a continuous presentations, a lot of writing, a lot of discussions. And uh, if you are unable to cope with it, you are definitely going to lose out on a lot of learning process. So this is a reason if you haven't given your exams for English language qualifications, you can check that on UCL website, which are program specific, good and advanced level. There are different types of tests you can give. Uh, ILTS and TOEFL are very common and I will encourage you if you want to do that, you should do it. Um, then coming back to the personal statement. The third part you will upload on your application is the personal statement. And personal statement, what we are looking for there is your motivation and your career. Says why this course is going to benefit your career. It's not an immediate benefit, it's the long-term benefit we are looking at. What is that motivation you have that this course is going to provide you? The, and if you 
have a previous experience. It's not necessary that you need to have a previous experience, work experience, but if you have, you must highlight it because it always will be looked positively. So that was all about the eligibility. Now let's dwell down a little bit into the course overview itself. Um, so uh, I mentioned you, we have a four, three core models. Uh, fourth is research project. So these are compulsory, you have to do them. So the first is uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery, the burns, military injury wounds, and wound healing, uh, research methodology, and research projects. And these are being done uh, at a different terms. So as I said, we start in October, and October to December is term one, January to March is term two, and April to July is term three. By end of July, you will complete your course if you are a full-time student. So that's where our term ends. And then for a month, there is a recess. And in September, there will be some examination, which we call YY examination for research project. And these are the terms which we are looking at. So most of your core models will be in term one and two between October till March, they will be done. Uh, so if you are only doing a part-time option where you want to complete only the taught module, you know you're looking for a commitment between October till March. Uh, if you are not doing your research project, then uh, that is a commitment you need it. If you are doing a research project, you will be doing that in term two and three, which is January till July. So I said about the other optional model. So this is a list of eight different uh, optional models we have. You will be only choosing three optional models. So the first one is systematic review, um, uh, reviews of interventions, part one and part two. You can't take part two if you haven't completed part one. Uh, applied tissue engineering, biometrics and regenerative medicine. But at the same time, we also got skills model, uh, which are generally very popular with our students, which are advanced surgical skills in microsurgery, robotic skills. Uh, there is uh, stem cells and their application, but it's not a skill space, but this is more uh, taught model. And then we have a new model which was added uh, two years before, which is basic and advanced reconstructive surgical skills. So this is again hands-on model. Okay, I will give you a brief, brief about each of this model, very briefly to mention you about what you can expect and what you will learn from this model. So first core model or a compulsory model is the plastic and reconstructive model, where we are focusing on range of different topics, hand, breast, face, eyes, nose, um, and uh, looking into abnormal plasty and reconstructive surgeries starts with very basic into reconstructive ladder and then we build the knowledge around it. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of different areas in reconstructive surgeries, what you are looking at, hand surgery, craniofacial surgeries, aesthetic surgery. Uh, the way we are looking and assessing this model is there is a 75% coursework. So it's a written report, which we actually submit, followed by a 25% oral presentation. The second module is burns and plastic, uh, burns military, sur um, military surgery model. And this is a very special, and this is a USP uh, of our course uh, since last 10 years we have been doing because we get a military surgeons to come and teach you and interact with you uh, on this. So there is a component which is dedicated is the burns surgery. It's quite a heavy when we look at the burns component, which starts with introductions, pathophysiology, uh, resuscitation, reconstruction. And then there are military specific models which uh, are covered by the military surgeons. Um, and uh, the predominantly we get surgeons from Queensville Elizabeth Hospital, which is known uh, for uh, their work in military surgery. Again, the assessment of this model is coursework followed by an oral presentation. So this is a, just a snapshot of different uh, clinicians um, and consultant plastic surgeons who have been working with us, who have been delivering uh, courses and coming and engaging with you. And they are specialized in their own uh, domain. So you will get an opportunity to interact and network uh, alongside learning from these guys. The third compulsory module is research methodology. Uh, this module is being introduced because we expect at master's level, you should have a good understanding of statistics, writing and surgical pl uh, research planning, uh, presentation skills. So this model is mainly done online and uh, uh, this particular model is where your exam is 100% um, and it's about two hour duration, but this is where we will be focusing on this. Now, that was all about the optional model. 
um, the other optional module is advanced uh, skills. So advanced uh, skills in microsurgery. So advanced skills in microsurgery is uh, delivered at our partner hospital at Northwick Park and it's Griffin Institute. Uh, when you take this model, it's an optional model. If you take this model, you will also get a certification with it. So that's provided by um, the Griffin Institute itself. The other optional model is robotic skills. Again, it's run at Northwick Park uh, and uh, you will get a completion certification along with, uh, so you have the MSU certification, which is a separate one, but it's a very specific site specific and Griffin Institute specific certification also being provided by the uh, faculty there. The third skills model, uh, uh, which is very recently being introduced is uh, advanced skills in uh, plastic surgery. And this model has been uh, running for now two years. Um, and the way we are looking at, there are various different things which are covered. This particular model runs at Royal Free itself. So this is your base where most of the teaching will happen, Royal Free Hospital. And this model is run there itself through Wilson Center for Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, which was uh, formed last year uh, by Professor Butler. And you will be looking at various types of suturing techniques, skin grafts, nerve repair, tendon repair. Uh, most of these skills courses are intensive one week courses. So if you take this model within a week, you will be finishing your uh, learning at the same time you will be finishing your assessment. So there is no extra time required to catch up with any uh, coursework like you had to do with the taught models. So skills built model are for that reason are very popular that you actually essentially finish everything. Uh, these are our labs in Wilson Center. So you can see the students from last year have been actually doing their um, uh, suturing. Uh, there are different types of stuff which is being provided to students. So they start with something very simple with synthetic and then they move on to uh, more um, uh, sort of natural tissues, which uh, eventually the center can procure and provide it to student based on their skills. The other optional model is stem cells. Uh, and this is again stem cells in surgery, where the main focus has been on uh, teaching students about and making them aware about stem cells. Uh, we know that stem cell based therapies are very popular in plastic surgery, in cosmetic surgery, but there is a lack of knowledge when we look at it is what those therapy mean, what those regulations are, how safe they are. So these kind of things is what these models will be aiming at. And you have an unseen examination with a poster presentation is uh, laid by Matthias Garelli. Then we have a tissue engineering uh, model. And again, it's a 100% coursework. This is again an advanced model where you are not only looking at, you are, you are reflecting back on the problems within clinic and trying to think how these advanced um, techniques such as tissue engineering can actually come to your aid to solve those problems. And that is what you will be introduced in this particular. It starts from basic biology. So it's not necessarily that you have to have uh, know what the cell is um, because you will be learning uh, through this model. There are some uh, pre-model uh, sessions where you go through and brush up your ideas about the cell, uh, cell biology before you introduce and get into uh, organ transplant, organ replacements, um, how things work uh, when you are trying to synthetically make organs uh, before they can be used for human applications. Biomaterials is again, similar model, which actually um, I would say go hand in hand with tissue engineering. And there's a lot of materials we use in surgeries, starting from sutures to various implants. This model is designed for students to understand how they interact, how their immune reaction would be, how you actually counter those immune reaction, how do you design better materials uh, which can be suitable for human applications. So that's what you will learn about this. Systematic review, as his name suggests, we are actually looking at uh, how to define research questions, um, how to write systematic reviews. You will be uh, introduced to croquet uh, reviews, uh, different types of strategies which are being used. The advanced version of systematic review part one is part two. And uh, that is where you actually go into much more detail about statistics, interpretation of data, how to write systematically and uh, present your clinical data um, in a more, uh, I would say comprehensive fashion. 
So that's exactly what's uh, going in this model. So these were pretty much of the taught model part. Research project is also essentially then culminates. So the way we plan is uh, start of the MSc for at least from December to March, you will be given all the knowledge um, where you are learning from the experts in terms of your taught models. But then in the second half of your MSc, you apply that knowledge. This is where the research project come in. And generally you make a decision within the first term what your project will be. And it can be a clinical or a, non, uh, or a lab based project. Uh, we have both facilities because we are in hospital and we also have a lab within the hospitals. So you can choose, you have a lot of freedom to discuss your project, to talk to a staff member before you make your decision. And you culminate that with a dissertation or a report, uh, which is about 15,000 words. And it's get sub submitted towards uh, by end of July. Uh, there is a lot of different types of projects. So you can think about in uh, interoperative augmentation with modified uh, artificial intelligence, still augmented reality, uh, looking into 3D printing of ear and nose, using different bioprinting of different medical devices, in uh, tissue engineering, tendon grafts, breast implants, artificial skins. Everything is on the table. Everything is discussed. We are all interested into these areas. Uh, anything which benefits our patients. So this is where I think the opportunity will be based on your interest. Uh, we will uh, provide you what projects we have, but if you have your own ideas about the project, we can uh, we encourage them for students to come and discuss and work out the feasibility. So where do we start now? So I've given you a lot of information, but Portigo is a place where you actually make your application. And this is a software which uh, or a platform within UCL where you will put your, your information, you will complete your uh, um, a submission of your application. All the communication happens through Portico. Uh, once you select the module, once and to do the registration itself with the UCL, after you get a final offer from UCL, uh, suggesting that you have been offered a place on this, you go on a Portico, you confirm. So everything happens on a Portico. So if you are planning to apply and make an application, make sure you get yourself uh, familiar with the system. Uh, again, it's, uh, the website is actually put there. It's ucl.ac.uk forward slash portico. Go there and you will use it. The other model or the other platform we will use in terms of teaching, and uh, which is very well integrated, is Moodle. And Moodle is the place where you will get access to all your lecture slides. You will get information about all the events, the forms, and general. Now, the reason I'm giving this information to you because it will be very different from where you are based at or the way the education work in your uh, universities, uh, whichever countries you are in. Um, maybe they already have this or maybe they don't have this, but this is a platform we are actually using. So I'm making sure that you are aware there will be a lot of communications and everything we use. We use a lot of technology. There is a lot of internet usage. Um, uh, so those were the online facilities. Coming back to the physical resources, on-site, there is a library uh, within the hospital, which is a UCL library. You can borrow. There is a computer cluster, printing, and other copier facilities. Uh, you get division lockers and stuff when you are resident within the building. Uh, coming back to the, uh, you know, the population and the students come, I said that we got a student from all over the world. More than 95% of our students are actually international. And uh, there is a huge amount of interest. There is a huge amount of support for them. London is a multidisciplinary and multicultural city. So you will always find something which is of interest to you and you will enjoy your time here. There is a lot of uh, student welfare activities which happens. Um, so that's something you can go and look at our uh, new international student page. Um, when you are planning to apply, there is an orientation program happens every year in September, towards the end of September. Uh, so. If you apply, we will encourage you to come somewhere in the mid-September so you can get yourself familiarized with the weather, familiarized with the culture, with people, transportations, the university campus before you can start your program. Make a lot of friends. Also, uh, when you are here, you also get a member of staff as a tutor. They are actually readily accessible with department and it's a one-to-one -one contact for you where you can discuss any academic or personal problems with them. Um, now, in terms of coming, uh, so that was all about the program. Now, let's think about what the student have done after they finish their MSc. 
as I said, one of the output the students were looking at is publications. So quite a lot of it because they do work, but that lead they should that should lead to some sort of an output on their CV. So apart from getting an MSc degree, there are more than hundred publications the MSc students have produced, and these are very good journals where these have been done, including nature publications, science, and all kind of stuff. So this is a very brief list of what I'm showing you. There are book chapters, book review paper. But this is all depends on students and their motivation. Um, but the support is there. This cannot happen without uh, academic support. So uh, I want to give you that uh, impression that there is a lot of academic activity. Uh, the book we actually published a couple of years uh, before, it's got more than 150,000 downloads now. It's being accessed in 194 countries. So it's pretty dominant right now in uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery as a textbook. And uh, the proud thing about it, that it was came out of the program we actually uh, uh, started at UCL. Uh, so this is from our course. And there is a huge contribution from our MSc student. Uh, we have a presence on Facebook and I'm sure I think quite a lot of uh, you might have actually uh, came to about this open day through our Facebook page where we do put any new events or anything which is uh, upcoming on our Facebook page. We have a Twitter page. Um, this is a, a couple of years before. This is a batch of students uh, where we actually took this picture uh, within our hospital. Um, as I said, we have a prospectus and uh, where you can find a lot more information. Quite a lot of your questions would be answered just by going through a prospectus, which is on our website. Uh, obviously, if you have to contact me, you can contact me. But at the same time, we have a course administrator, uh, Mr. Jamali, and he's also quite helpful. So you can even put questions um, for if you want to follow up on your applications once thing is done you can send us uh, questions. We may not be able to answer every questions while they are with registry and uh, through the application department. But once we have an update, we will be able to give you some information on this. So that's pretty much about the program itself. Uh, what I will do, I will open the call for questions from you. If you have anything, you can even uh, you know unmute yourself and talk to me or you can put them in a chat function and we can go through them one by one at a time. Thank you so much, Deepak. And um, hopefully we have got some questions um, that have come in as well, but um, thank you again for providing such a thorough overview of the program. Um, shall I kickstart with the questions that we've received Please. and um, we can go from there. Okay, perfect. So uh, one of our attendees has submitted their application for the full time program and is asking, am I able to convert from full time to part time with the same application? Uh, yeah, I think they can. They should be able to do it. They will they will need they need to request that uh, to the applications. Uh, so send that uh, email back to the registry saying that can you please amend my application? And they should be able to do that uh, because, uh, again, I don't know the student. I don't know your application. So I think that's the first thing I would suggest that if it is very recently made, uh, then uh, you can amend it. If it is something where you already received an offer, then you will have to discuss that with us. So if you don't have an offer, um, go back to the, uh, the applications department or a registry and tell them that can can you amend that and they will be able to tell you whether you are eligible or not okay great thanks Deepak and the next question is from Sushet Dillon which is can we still apply as a medical student since by the time they graduate the deadline for the course application will close uh, so it depends uh, if they are graduating uh, if they're graduating before October, they can apply. So that means they, they can still submit their um, final certification, which could be a provisional one by September so that um, they can get a final offer. So there is, a, there is a feasibility. What we can't consider is the intercalation. So we used to do intercalation, but now uh, we are not allowed to do an intercalation. So you have to complete your degree before you come on this course. Great, thank you, Deepak. And the next question is just asking, what is the difference between the MSc and PG? Uh, so the difference is number of credits. 
The MSc program is 180 credits and it will take you about a year to complete. And PG certificate is only 60 credits. So you will be doing only four modules, uh, 15 credit each. So that's very, very much a uh, taught model. There is no practical involved there. So uh, you have three uh, compulsory models. So burns and plastic and reconstructive surgery are compulsory. You may get a choice to do a uh, two optional model, uh, but that again depends uh, once you apply for it. And we, we can we can actually advise. We, uh, we do that uh, on a case by case basis to advise them uh, what models are available and what model they can take. Uh, but that is the main difference there is the number of credits. Great. Well, hopefully that has answered that question. So the next question is asking, do we need to show a proof of English level like a IELTS or is it valid if we have done a medical, a medical degree in English? So if you are uh, not based in uh, United Kingdom, I think you will be required to provide an English language qualification. Um, that's the standard requirement. You will still be offered a letter um, if you apply, but it will be conditional. Great. And then we have a couple of questions from the next attendees. This is Andreas. Um, so just a couple of questions. So they watched last year's presentation and there was a third option of taking a smaller research project while taking two additional optional modules. Has this option been discontinued now? Yes, it is being discontinued. So that was a mitigation during COVID time. Uh, but now the UCL has come out of COVID. So now that option is no longer exist. Okay. And then the second part of the question is, um, how many modules do you suggest taking per term? Is there a typical number of modules that most students take during each term? So that depends on if you are a full-time student or a part-time. So if, uh, Andreas, you want to tell us whether you are coming as a full-time or a part-time, I can answer that better. If it is a full-time, then you have to go what's uh, already programmed. If you have a part-time, then you will definitely select the model you want to do in year one, and you can do research project in year two with some of the models next year. Yeah, okay. Great. And um, also, I've just I'm in the process of allowing everyone to talk. So if you do for any questions like this one, if it's easier to just um, to tell us over over the call, please do. So I'm just in the process of making sure everyone has um, has a chance to be able to let their microphone work. So, Andreas, I think I've just let yours um, yeah, hello, go live. Here. Yep, perfect. Uh, so yeah, I'm interested in the full time uh, uh, course uh, MSc, and I'm just wondering how many modules uh, would uh, you suggest for us to take? Uh, I and I'm aware that some of the courses, as uh, Professor Kalaskar previously mentioned, are, for example, like the surgical skills courses, run over one week. So I'm aware of that, but generally, for example, for the first term, how many would be a reasonable aim, you know, to have? Uh, so if you're a full-time student, uh, these are already planned. There is nothing you can say that how many reasonable I'm taking. You had to do all the 180 credits. So in the term one, the compulsory models will run. So minimum three models you are actually doing as soon as you get enrolled as a full-time student. So burns and plastic surgery, um, uh, you got uh, plastic surgery model, the burns and military surgery model, research methodology model. These models will start immediately. So three are the term one. They are there. Uh, so anyone taking on a course and who has to complete this, whether they are an MSc or a PG certificate, will be enrolled on these models by default. And then the optional model, they will run in term two. So based on if you choose... Uh, Skills-based models, they are generally in February, February to March uh, until April, they will run there. So uh, you will get a, you, you can then decide based on uh, when you are available, uh, you can actually choose this model. So that will be term two. So I would say two models at a time, two, three models at a time uh, per term is what you are actually looking at. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Andreas. Is there any other question? We have got more questions, but yes, I can see that 
we've got questions from someone that's raised their hand, so it would be wonderful to have them answer that. So, uh, yes, is it Bernal? Bernal? Yes, hi. Um, hi. This is, I'm Brian. Um, I'm one of the registered nurses. I just wanted to know for the PG cert, um, what are the modules that we need to um, complete? Is it still the um, compulsory modules that include uh, burns, um, reconstructive surgery, and research? Or can we choose other um, modules for that instead of taking the three? Uh, I think you will you will complete the compulsory for sure. So there will be a compulsory. You will get option for one of the module, which is uh, uh, optional module. So you can actually choose one of the skill space model. Okay, thank you. Okay. Great. So we have a couple more questions, um, some anonymous attendees. So we'll just address those. And then equally, if anyone um, does want to uh, have their question over over the recording itself just raise your hand and we will get to you so um just to go through the list again so what work has been done by members of the department on artificial skin substitutes please yeah i think we have done a quite a lot there is a lot of bioprinting work we do and that's where our major major focus is um uh, because buns is a part of uh, the uh, one of the theme we actually teach uh, and plastic surgery, uh, the skin is one of the most important area for research. So there is a lot of work going on. Uh, there are clinical trials also going on, looking at different uh, synthetic grafts which are available on the market. We are comparing them, we are evaluating them, trying to see which one effectively works, which doesn't work. Uh, not specifically that Royal Free is the center for burns, but uh, there are other hospitals in London who are the burn center. So we collaborate with these guys to work with. Um, when we are actually doing this. But as far as the research is concerned, there is an ongoing research going on. And when you come there on a day one, there will be a tour of uh, the facilities and you will meet all the academic staff who are present and they will give you a brief about different types of research they are involved in. That will be an excellent opportunity for you to even interact with these guys. Um, but as, uh, as I said, anything to look at advance, uh, advancements, is uh, bioprinting. So bioprinting is the one area which I'm interested. Uh, we are doing quite a lot of work to develop disease models for skins, uh, their cancer models, skin cancer models, um, and just not looking from a graft and uh, reconstructive point of view, but there are other therapeutic applications we actually look. Um, there are also uh, uh, diabetic foot ulcer. There is a big clinic where, within the hospital where the diabetic foot ulcer is actually being treated. So they are always looking for solutions of neuropathic pain. They're looking for skin grafts. They're looking for new solutions um, for uh, autografting. So this is where I think, so the question you ask is a very important question. Thanks, Deepak. And then the next question is from Toyin. So um, Toyin has submitted their application, uh, but in their words, I think I have fluffed my personal statement after listening to this talk. Any chance of amending it or should I just accept my fate? <laughs> Stay positive. <laughs> I'll hand over to you, Deepak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Um, uh, Toyin, have you heard back about your outcome? If you haven't, then it's possibly still with the uh, registry. Uh, and if it is still with the registry, we haven't actually reviewed your application. So the process is very simple. You first apply to the UCL, okay? The UCL has to do the screening of your documentations. They need to verify your referees. So references are important. And uh, there is a very important point while we are talking about referees, you have to insist your referee to use official email addresses. They cannot use their personal email addresses. UCL will not consider them or that will your application will get delayed uh, because of that reason. It won't process. Um, and once, because they had to verify that they are the they, they are the genuine people writing this reference for you, uh, apart from you are checking your uh, um, uh, transcript, uh, this is another important point. You want to make sure you have addressed it. Uh, so if you have done that and the application is not being passed on to us, um, so once this uh, sort of screening is done, then the application comes to department. It can take anywhere between four weeks before I actually see your application. So if you have recently made an application, I will not know until four weeks. And after four weeks, 
we get some time to review those application, do some communication with the candidate if he needs any clarification. And then we are looking at usually about eight week period before you should know the outcome of your uh, applications. So if you haven't heard back and your application is still with registry, there may be a scope. You can say that I want to update and put a new statement on it. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Does that answer everything, Toyin? Just to just to check. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Great. And so we'll move on to the next question, which is how often would one have to be on site for teaching for full time or part time if they're not based in London? How often would I have to commute to London? OK, so that's very uh, that's very common question. Uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, so I think our program is very flexible. When you come, we'll be looking at three days commitment and three days commitment is because you will be on site for three days. Um, so the days again, this depends on the model you are choosing. So if it is a full time student, you will be coming on Tuesdays. Uh, I think you will come on Monday, Tuesdays online lecture and then Thursday, Fridays. So pretty much most of our teaching is being loaded towards the end of the week uh, because we we have we, we wanted to ensure that if there are part time or flexible student working, they are somehow able to get their rota scheduled accordingly. So we are looking at three day actual commitment as a full time student. If you're a part time student, you had to half it because you will be choosing half the number of program models then to deliver. Uh, so this is how I roughly will plan it. And. If you want to actually know uh, the timetable, there will be a timetable, which uh, I think uh, pretty much is finalized. If you send me an email after this, we can actually, I can ask Jama to send you back an overview timetable, which will give you a rough idea to plan your schedule around it. Um, so this is where we're looking. If you are asking for number of hours is about 20 hours of teaching which includes it's not just teaching it also includes the coursework and everything for a full-time student per week and if you're a part-time we are uh, looking down um, somewhere about uh, 10 to 5 to 10 hours of teaching okay so part-time student is there if you're outside London and there is a lot of commute then I would say you think about this whether you really think for a full-time will be the right option for you uh, the last thing we want is you uh, stress uh, later um, because there is a commitment and you are committing to yourself. So you can make that discussion. You can discuss that option with us. Um, you can send an email to me and say that, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what my logistic is. This is how I'm looking at my work and working around it. What will be the best possible option for me? And we can then sit down with you and tell you these are the models which are going to run around this time. Uh, is uh, something is feasible? and you can plan accordingly. So this is very specific uh, for an individual. Uh, we can always consider that and we can discuss with you. Thanks, Deepak. I'm conscious we have about four minutes left. So we've got three questions. The first one actually ties on nicely to um, you explaining that actually, please do reach out to you following today's event. So if you can just remind the audience of your contacts, email address that is best for for anyone to contact you by for any questions or um... yeah what i will do is uh, i'm going to put my i'm just going to give them because uh, we do have uh, i'm just going to find it okay <clears throat> because they get this email will get picked up perfect even if i'm not able to uh, so i'm just going to find the email And if I'm allowed, I can put that in a chat function. So this is the dsis.bprs at ucl.ac.uk. So if you use that email, it will go to Jama, it will go to me. So if I'm unable to reply you immediately, Jama will pick it up and he can do it. Any administrative related queries, he will handle it. Anything which is specific, uh, which you want to know about eligibility, uh, you want to ask me about any specific uh, model, I will be able to answer that quickly. Perfect. Thank you, Deepak. And we'll just take another question. Uh, so how much of the compulsory modules will take place on site for the full time course in that case? Um, just because, again, this person is not based in London. Yeah. 
Yeah, so 70% attendance is compulsory by UCL. So you, you had to show 70% engagement. So I would say out of the 100% uh, lectures, 70% is something we would like to see you at, uh, uh, at campus. Uh, this program is not distance learning. Uh, so that is where I think, uh, you know, you need to consider whether that's feasible. Uh, there is a, uh, quite a lot of flexibility with happen after COVID. So quite a lot of lectures actually become online available. Quite a few of our academic staff actually can, uh, some of them, they do online lectures, but not predominantly. They also want to come back. So uh, we had many clinicians which actually do the core module or compulsory module. They insisted they want to see and physically come in the uh, on campus. So if the clinicians are and the, your lecturers are coming physically, the students are by default will be expected. In that case, we we don't record those lectures. Uh, so this is where I think, uh, you know, you can again look at the timetable and make your final decision. Fantastic. And actually, we do have a bit of time to, we've got one final question. So we've got time to address it in a minute. Um, if I take three optional skill modules, will they end in three weeks? That's the final question. Yeah, so uh, these optional models are there, but they are being allocated based on batches. So it depends on which batch you have been allocated. So as I said, the uh, skills model will start somewhere from uh, February till uh, April. So within that two month, uh, based on how many students are there, you will be allocated different batch. So it's not necessarily that you will be getting into consecutive three weeks. They could be one week in February and two weeks in uh, one week in March, another week in April. Um, so that all depends on how many students actually go because these are skill space. There is a limit of number of students who can actually go at a time based on the facilities. And I think there is a cap of 10 students per module. So who will be doing this? And there are a number of batches. You can always request, um, uh, you know, forcing this is when the module is going to run. If you, if you want, you can request them that based on my schedule, I would like to have this model this time, this time, this time. If there is a availability, please put me in and they will consider it. So um, as I said, we are very flexible. We completely understand uh, most of our students predominantly, they're actually working. So we make a lot of adjustments, uh, but the only thing, the last expectation we have is the commitment because once you commit it, then, and once you enroll in a course, we just accept that you are committed. Okay, so we will be pushing you to make sure that you complete it, you engage in those kind of stuff. Um, but other than that, I think there is a lot of support available. Uh, you can, uh, we will try and see whether that's necessary. We will do another open day in uh, June. Uh, if Because I'm sure once you apply, you will have more questions and those questions will be slightly different. This will be more about coming to London and those kind of stuff, but uh, more than happy to answer those questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Deepak. And I think hopefully that should, uh, we've, it seems like we've addressed everyone's questions. So that's fantastic. So um, we're actually out of time and uh, we'll need to leave it there. So however, we do have a, a quick feedback form that will pop up on your screen following today's session, which um, we'd love to hear about how you found the event. And just lastly, we want to say thank you so much for all your comments, questions, and thank you so much, Deepak, for an excellent session. We hope you all have a great evening. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And uh, thank you very much, Kate. I think that's excellent uh, <laughs> sharing from your side. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Bye.